you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, the person who does most of the work, and that's Christine Lilly, and she's the postdoc working on this program and has been a part of its creation and follow through. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the other people that have been part of this, uh, look, trying to look at, at a real societal problem that may turn on intellectual humility, and that is the, the ways in which false convictions occur. And, the ways in which uh, certainty may get in the way of information search. Um, and these are various individuals, psychologists, lawyers, and here's our co-grant holder in Lasana Harris, and Lasana is now in the Netherlands and moving to England and, and traveling worldwide uh, in, in, in search of intellectual humility, I guess. Um, and, and thank you for the generous funding to do this work. I'm actually going to talk about this study, which has three phases. The first phase, we, we used law students to attempt to figure out how they employed evidence differentially, depending upon a variety of indicators of perhaps certainty or, or concern for uh, gathering additional information once an opinion had been formed, and believe that that was part of the process. And the reason this is part of the process, in our view, is that one, one thing about the legal system we don't always understand is that once a prosecutor brings forward a case, it's a rare case. About 90% of cases are settled in plea bargain. So the prosecutor has to be quite sure, at least in terms of confidence of the facts, to bring a case forward to the courts. Uh, we'll see later that that may be a source of bias. Uh, Lamont Armstrong is one example of a false conviction. Uh, this is a person who spent 17 years in prison for stabbing and strangling his neighbor, a professor at North Carolina A&T. The police paid another man who was a heroin addict to record conversations with Lamont in an attempt to get him to confess, which never happened. He never did confess. Lamont's name was not on the victim's list of people who owed her money. She lent money around town, uh, but the prosecution claimed it was. Witnesses who saw the victim alive after Lamont was thought to have killed her were not made available to the defense. That they were eliminated from, from bring, being brought forward. Uh, and in fact, they were withheld, even as exculpatory witnesses, when only the prosecution knew about it. Now, I'm not really trying to villainize the prosecution. This is a very difficult role. What we'll see, though, is that it's a role. It, it takes me away from considering intellectual humility as something that is contained within us something that may be a component of the roles we're made to play, some of which call for more certainty than other roles we are made to play. Um, uh, and the palm print was discovered at the scene and finally analyzed 17 years later. That information was not avail made available by the prosecution team. It matched a previous suspect who had since been convicted of murdering his own father. So one of the real casualties of false conviction is not only the 17 years lost in this individual's life, but the fact that if part of it is community safety, if that's part of what the prosecutor and, and the prosecution is into in, in, in playing, in, in, in enacting their role, it really didn't help. A lot of the cases where the perpetrator went free and was later found to be the case, there were other capital crimes that that perpetrator who went free uh, occurred. So there's a social cost to these errors that go beyond the individual cost uh, to the individual, to the person wrongfully convicted. I, I call it the civil rights movement of the 21st century. In a way, starting about in the 1980s, really not the beginning of the 21st century, we started to actually collect data on how many of these existed. Um, Barry Sheck, a variety of lawyers formed innocence projects. We have one at Duke, and they uh, uh, got us into this and availed us of their case examples that we could use in our studies. Uh, but it, it, we, we uh, the total, which you can't see very well here, there, by uh, starting in about 1989, there have been 1,600 uh, falsely, convic uh, falsely convicted, wrongfully convicted uh, individuals. That's a lot, because if you, if you count the time they spent in jail, we're talking of something like 16,000 uh, uh, years in, in jail as a function of that era. Uh, and, uh, and these are the reasons that, that uh, and, and what the contributing factors were that lead to exoneration. 
Uh, I can hardly read these myself. So, <laughs> uh, 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 as you can see, one is it's a false perjury or false accusation. So, eyewitness well, testimony or testimony itself is very convincing, not only to jurors but to prosecutors. So. So that becomes, uh, that's, that's available, this is gonna add to more than 100% because some wrongful conviction cases contain more than one of these. Uh, mis, uh, a, a, a mistaken witness ID, perjury of false ac accusation, false confession, where you know, we've all seen the arduous uh, interrogation procedures that might give rise to an individual saying, okay, I gotta get out of this room, I did it. Uh, and, uh, and then false or misleading forensic evidence, uh, uh, bringing a, uh, a piece of evidence that was not probative forward uh, or using a false piece of evidence, and then official misconduct. That would be what we were talking about before, withholding exculpatory evidence from the defense. Okay, that, that also happens. And this is the, from the University of Michigan. They collect these data in their research and survey research center. So that, that's a lot of individuals convicted over time. 1,700 people is a good number of people serving a lot of time. Uh, prosecutors, you know, the Supreme Juror, and uh, there's a conviction psychology that goes along with prosecution. Uh, we tend to buy into it. We get a very biased view of the law from programs I truly like. I watch them late into the night. I watch all the reruns. Um, but the idea that you have this upright prosecutor protecting community from these horrible individuals who prey upon all of us is sort of the picture that we, we get. And uh, that picture has to affect us as we take on roles of, like jurors and, and other instances and, and also other aspects of the trial affect us. Like a lot of evidence is being presented as we can see. There's only one person in that room who's alleged to have been the origin of the act. Uh, and they're associated with that evidence. It's a really interesting psychological issue with regard to just cognition about, about responsibility. Um, okay, prosecutorial passion, really honest biases. That, that this, the, a lot of times they're dealing with horrible acts, dismembered people, children killed, uh, awful things that, we, that brings about a prosecutorial passion and a passion in the general public for a horrible, ugly crime. Uh, wanting a resolution. Uh, the culture of the prosecutor's office is that we use conviction rate as a measure of success. Uh, and it's an elected office frequently in, in most states. Uh, it's not an appointed office. And so it's not free of the opinions that, that the public hold of the prosecutor and this success as well. Um, the case of, of Glenn Ford, this is a prosecutor who 33 years ago convicted a guy who was finally found to be innocent. And in terms, I want you to read this in terms of intellectual humility. Uh, my mindset was wrong and blinded me to my purpose of seeking justice rather than obtaining a conviction of a person who I believed to be guilty. I did not hide evidence. I simply did not seriously consider that sufficient information may have been out there that could lead to a different conclusion. In 1984, I was 33 years old. It's, uh, and I, it's 30 years ago. And I was arrogant, judgmental, narcissistic, and very full of myself. I was not as interested in justice as I was in winning. Winning is misspelled, but that's okay. How totally wrong was I? Uh, and this was an editorial in the local newspaper in the, in the jurisdiction in which he was a district attorney, and, um, and this, an ADA, actually. And uh, he was a lead prosecutor. Um, and this is Glenn Ford was the person who was put away on the basis of this for, I believe, nearly 30 years. Uh, I'm not going to go much into the uh, defense attorneys, but they have a different uh, they have a different task. It's a different role. Uh, they, there are different versions of, of defense attorneys. There, there are those who are really political activists, public defender's office, who are providing defense for those who, who don't have the resources for that defense. There also, there's no absolute truth. There's a legal positivist uh, skeptical about what the nature of truth is and, and does any evidence really reveal who the individual is or is there an exculpatory always. And then the egoist, you know, the sort of um, Johnny Cochran kind of egoist. You know, he gets out there and, and he's going to prove that he is going to demonstrate the error of our ways in this. And, and, 
And then you have the garbage collector, people who in fact are looking for uh, legal cases and ways to, to in fact in, in define a practice in relationship to individuals. So they're a different case and, and they're, they magnify the degree of information as a, uh, in order to create doubt. Okay? And it, it takes additional information from that which is being put before this to create doubt. Systematic individual differences that we thought were important were belief in a just world. Essentially, individuals accused of a crime probably deserve that fate, okay? That, that there's a deservingness notion. There's a work, this is work by Melvin Lerner and a variety of others that indicates this is a very valid individual difference. So, so uh, that, that some individuals viewing another suffering, uh, there, there is an individual difference in the degree that we uh, observe that suffering as a function of the individual's deservingness. Studies showing even when the individual does not deserve it, it's random, that we create a deservingness narrative. Um, and uh, for some of us, and it's an individual difference characteristic, but also a general tendency that we possess uh, for all of us to do this, to justify, and what goes along with it is justifying the systems we live within. Now, whether it be the legal system, if an error gets made, well, that's the system. You know, that's how it is. That's why the or the fact that there are income disparities. And we, if we attribute that not so much to the malevolence of the system itself, but the nature of the system that bears so many positive fruits that we tolerate this negative one uh, and may not even see it as negative. Conscientiousness, the degree to which I really are, I'm gonna search for multiple pieces, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna comb the, uh, uh, the, the details to find as much as I can, and I'm conscientious wanting to make the right decision. Need for cognition, uh, very important variable in a lot of social psychology, which, which has to do with my tendency to seek information, uh, my need to make proper judgments, to think properly. And legal attitudes, uh, like uh, some of us are more authoritarian prone than others of us, so that, that we, we tend to to take the role of the authority. And juror bias, which has been found for jurors to be based upon a variety of factors that lead one to be prosecutorial or defense oriented in, in observing data. Uh, and uh, uh, general intellectual humility we measured, which was critical to this particular project. And then legal intellectual humility, which is domain specific. And what I'd like to argue is that I think domain specific, and I'll argue in advance of the day, excuse me, Domain-specific intellectual humility is critical because the many roles we play throw us in different positions with regard to what we are doing, whether we're a college professor teaching in something we have high expertise in and there are role demands on us to present this in a particular way, or whether we're a lawyer or a prosecutor. There are role demands which, in fact, uh, uh, are, are pertinent to the given a particular domain. So the, the, the general trait of being intellectually humble may not be important in all instances. Um, and I think our colleagues at Duke, uh, Mark Leary and, and Ray Coyle, have actually discovered that they get differentiation in the, in, the, in the specific case, not just legal, in other specific cases, but not general intellectual humility as an attribute, uh, uh, which is another way of saying as a part social psychologist, that much of intellectual humility is not in our hearts. It's in the situations we confront. Uh, uh, it, it's not whether we are a better person for being humble. There is some of that, for sure, we can measure it. But what it affects in our life is really dependent upon the situations we are put within. Uh, okay, intellectually, here's how we measured it. General intellectual humility, I question my own opinions, positions, and viewpoints, because it'll be wrong. This is Rick's and Mark's scale. These, uh, I reconsider my options when presented with new evidence. That's a general, not legal issue with evidence. And then legal, when it comes to issues about law and justice, I recognize that I don't know all the information that can inform my views, and these are sample items. I would be willing to take account of the views of others who believe things that are different than mine. Uh, and that is pertaining to the law. When it comes to issues of law and justice and legal decisions, this is true of me or not. Uh, the method, we used 320 law students from several institutions. 
um, and uh, read four actual wrongful conviction cases, presenting as complete an array of the evidence as we could to these law students. And they were then presented with one of four types of evidence. The evidence that was really used at the trial he presented either uh, graphically uh, or non-graphically. Uh, it was either graphic evidence or non-graphic evidence, and you have both kinds, and I'll give you examples of those. And they're either relevant or not relevant to whether the person committed the crime. Okay? So how dismembered a body is has no relevance to who dismembered the body. But you get to show pictures of that in the guilt phase of a trial, and it's biasing. Um, so uh, this is an example, sample case expert. You can read it. I'm not going to read it to you, but, but it, it provides a wide array of details about the case and about the blood and the blood spatter. And sometimes we show pictures of this and sometimes not. And, and, and uh, this is, uh, so it was done verbally and without. And they answered questions about uh, guilt and punishment, uh, desire, guilt, and punishment. When presented with this evidence, uh, I, I can go back to this at some point if you want it, but this is a true example of a case uh, which I think re relatively recently uh, uh, George W. was freed. I think we got these from uh, uh, Cardozo, right? Cardozo in, in New York, uh, their, their innocence clinic. Uh, here's graphic and relevant. I mean, this is, you know, we have blood spatter in the sink of the, of the person's own home. <laughs> the perpetrator's own space. Um, not graphic, but relevant, would be the fingerprints. Um, this is both graphic and relevant. The fingerprints of the perpetrator demonstrated to be at the scene of the crime. Okay? That's not terribly graphic. It's a picture of a fingerprint. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, create midbrain arousal, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and here's not graphic and relevant. That is where you show the victim and how wonderful that victim was prior to this horrible thing that happened to her. This is frequently referred to as sincerely dead evidence by defense attorneys. That is that prosecutors will go up and really prove in a hundred different ways that this person is truly dead. Um, but the curious thing is in the guilt phase, it's highly biasing because there's no evidence that the perpetrator did these things. This is just how the person ended up based on what some perpetrator did. But we're not making judgments of some perpetrator. We're making judgments of a perpetrator who's alleged to have done this. Survey questions we ask, the defendant should be, this is the first phase of the study. The defendant should be convicted if there's at least an X percent chance that he committed the crime. Uh, that is, what's the threshold for conviction? How does that relate to the personality measures that we had noted before, particularly intellectual humility, and particularly, uh, as well, uh, domain-specific legal intellectual humility. Uh, sentencing, if the defendant found, were found guilty, what would be a fair sentence? And moral disgust, how disgusted are you by the crime? How morally outraged are you by the crime? How motivated are you to see someone convicted for this crime? Uh, so trying to get at some, some notion of moral disgust, because what I'm going to argue later is that when we aren't intellectually humble, it's frequently because emotional instances interrupt self-regulation. That is, that the, the normal self, it takes a lot of self-regulation to read and look at information, to try to look at alternative solutions. The more horrible the, up, the, more horrible the event, the more emotionally aroused, aroused we are, the poorer we are at search of information. And that generates a kind of uh, uh, limitation on, on humility, which, which could come out of a self-regulation system which is why in the last part of this, we do do some neural things. Um, survey questions, how dangerous is the defendant, overall pressure, prosecute, do you want to be, a, these are law students, would you prefer to be a prosecutor or a defense attorney after reading this case, and how comfortable would you, they didn't know that it was a false conviction in advance, they just given the evidence, okay, without the outcome. Uh, and regret. If the defendant were later found to be guilty or innocent, I would feel terrible. If it's a function of the law and I wouldn't feel terrible, uh, they had a bad attorney. <laughs> Those are opportunities to provide uh, how I would feel once somebody were found to either uh, not be guilty and, and be convicted or be guilty and not be convicted. How much regret would I experience as an attorney? Uh, 
these, as you can see, these are very mild correlations. And overall, on those internal attributes that make up these personality measures, you see that, this, that there is uh, not a whole lot of correlation with legal intellectual humility. Not a whole lot of them are correlated with that domain-specific component, the general personality dimensions. And here, even though these aren't strong, we have a sample of 320, so that they're reliable. You do find that general intellectual humility is correlated with uh, uh, legal attitudes, jura bias, need for cognition, these individual difference variables that array us as more or less individual, uh, intellectually humble. But the legal stuff is not really correlated with those individual difference dimensions, which leads me to argue that the variance is more situational in that specific case and more domain specific. If you're trying to predict who's intellectually humble, these are pre-study issues. These are the dimensions that we only have three uh, in the regression. We've given us a multiple R of about 0.50, which accounts for about 25% of the variance. And that is need for cognition, legal <coughs> attitudes, legal intellectual humility are the three best predictors of general intellectual humility, which, which should be meaningful because these two dimensions, I, I won't go into this, uh, are really involved in voir dire when, when you're selecting jurors. Frequently, the questions of the prosecutors and defense attorneys are bound to find these things out, okay? Find out whether this person is, is uh, more T has a tendency to arrive at their own decisions about right or wrong and, and their legal attitudes, particularly anti-authoritarianism. And defense attorneys use it as much as, as do prosecutors. Um, for each change in legal intellectual, here are, the, here are the results broken down. We got a three-way interaction on most things. That is, three-way interaction being the attribute, this, in this case, legal intellectual humility, graphicness and relevance. They kind of interacted to present us with our data. So we're giving you the pieces of this interaction. And what these curves represent is the correlation between legal intellectual humility and, uh, and uh, uh, threshold for conviction. So as we can see, we're, at, we're in a circumstance where we're in a reasonable doubt circumstance. So in, in this circumstance, we find that the, the thresholds for conviction range from about 90 to about 90, well, if you look at the individual difference pieces, all the way down to about 70%, which is quite absurd, uh, up to about, you know, if they're 70% responsible, I'll go with it, uh, up to 100%. Those, and that, those are sort of correlated in, particularly in this circumstance, where evidence is graphic but not relevant, okay? That is where you see the bloody sink, you see the bloody woman, and you see how, how not bloody she was in advance and how horrible this act was. You're likely, you, you're, some are, based on legal intellectual humility, uh, we tend to, um, uh, our threshold for conviction changes. Uh, and this is among law students. We have to remember that. So the overall model gives us a 0.27. Uh, multiple R, it counts for about 8% of the variance, so it ain't all the variance, but it's, it's a critical and significant portion of it. Enough to send somebody you don't want to be in prison to prison. Uh, but you, what I would note is that when you look at this particular cell, you're only looking at the piece of a three-way interaction. Okay, so, <clears throat> and this is the overall intellectual humility. This is the main effect for intellectual humility. Uh, so the, these are not necessarily compatible overall. Um, for e for, you have, remember, each unit of change in legal intellectual humility, the threshold for conviction moves five points. That's a lot. So every, every point along the scale of movement on intellectual humility increases my conviction threshold by five, or decreases my conviction threshold by five percent. So the more humble I am uh, in these scale points, which is, I think, quite remarkable in these cases, in these particular cells. And these are the important, graphic and not relevant, where, where information is graphic and not relevant. Here's what happens to dangerousness um, on a seven point scale, uh, Christine, five? On a five point scale, perception of dangerous moves down 1.3 points for every move up legal intellectual humility. This again is not enormous, but it is quite significant. It, 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 mean, it, it might, it, when we see what the threshold for conviction is, this notion of the person is dangerous and I'm protecting the community goes up considerably 
in terms of my acceptance of that information and my lack of humility with regard to taking in information not in my uh, viewpoint. Uh, and this is particularly interesting. The overall model in this particular cell, I've never gotten an overall R. I went back and we, we looked at this a number of times because we didn't think it could be true. But it is regret, which I found to be really interesting. These law students with lower levels of intellectual humility are more likely to say that wrongful convictions are a function of the law, not a function of me. I don't feel badly about it. It's, it's the way the law works. Most of the time, it works well. Some of the time, I had a law school dean tell me this when I started to research uh, innocence, that, that, you know, and, and if you saw a recent statement by Scalia at the Supreme Court about somebody who was found to be innocent, he said innocence has nothing to do with truth or not truth. If the person has had a, a fair trial and has gone through the system, there are going to be these errors. And you don't reverse them simply because, because it's a jury of your peers. And that's one of our Supreme Court justices. I find that interesting. But as far as there isn't the, the nature of regret from having put somebody away in prison that wasn't responsible for an act is related to legal intellectual humility. I think that's important because it indicates that it's not that self-corrective. Okay, if, if I have a case where I feel terrible about what I just did, prosecutor, I might be more circumspect the next time around, but if I don't have any regret about that, the likelihood of my being circumspect isn't high. So that there's a repeated circumstance here, and it's because the, the circumstance remains the same for the prosecutor. It, their outcomes are dependent upon their conviction hit rates. That's one very big reason for it. Uh, okay, so general is, predic is predicted by legal intellectual immunity. These are summaries. We know these already, so I can move ahead. Uh, only the domain, the domain specific legal intellectual humility predicted changes in interpretations of evidence and guilt, as we saw in those um, specific curves. Law students lower in legal intellectual humility showed a preference to act as the prosecutor. We also found that out. I don't think we showed you that. And as levels of legal intellectual humility increased, law students, one, required a higher threshold of guilt to justify a conviction expressed a greater regret at the idea of a wrongful conviction and perceived dependence as less dangerous. Results occurred when evidence was graphic and not relevant. This is the big error cell. This is showing, not, showing biased evidence. It's not just non-relevance. It's making non-relevance uh, uh, vivid. And it's, its vividness alters. There's a sort of interplay between vividness of an, an emotional ev evocation um, and disgust, and the tendency to apply intellectual resolutions to collect further information about a case. I think that's it. I have no data that says that. That's my interpretation, though. Um, do people actually want an intellectually humble lawyer? This is point two. Okay, so if I'm looking for some help, or I am the my my child is the victim of a crime, or what do I want my prosecutor? What do I want my lawyer? And we. For this, we didn't use law students. We used just enter, you know, the new, the new magic where subjects are everywhere. Uh, and, and solicited through MTurk. And they read descriptions of an intellectually arrogant person, an intellectually humble person, or a control described. Like Kyle holds his own personal beliefs very strongly and rarely changes his views based on things other than people, what people tell him. He thinks revising what he believes demonstrates a lack of intelligence. And it's a sign that you never truly believe in your own values. He likes to be in powerful positions, and he respects authority figures for holding strong to their deep convictions. And this is our humble Kyle. Um, he holds many beliefs very strongly. However, he enjoys listening to his friends' different viewpoints, and often he revises his own opinions based on how he views. Um, how good a defense lawyer would you think Kyle would be? And if you were charged with a serious crime, would you want Kyle to be your defense attorney? The same for a prosecutor. Uh, and what we find is that uh, how good a prosecutor you think Kyle would be does not differentiate individuals in, in terms of uh, uh, their intellectual humility. But how good a defense attorney is requires greater intellectual humility. I want my defender to be humble, uh, to recognize that their initial constraints on it may not be the proper ones. That's what we found, which doesn't go along with what we expected to find. We, but we do find from the narratives that people do understand that 
unmovable prosecutors are a good thing. Um, and <clears throat> so here are some of the narratives that were collected. Uh, intellectually humble, what's good, we asked them what, what was good about this humble person and what was bad about this humble person as an attorney. Well, he has the ability, good is he has the ability to see many viewpoints and take in logic about many different things. This is a defense attorney, and he's very openly, dumb people aren't that open-minded and willing to admit faults and correct them. Bad, none, six times they said none as a defense attorney. Uh, he had, doesn't have any faults, but maybe he's too flexible and would not fight hard enough on some point, was, was generated only after rejecting that there was something the matter with the intellectually humble uh, defense attorney. The intellectually arrogant, he won't let anything sway his opinions, but I think this would also be his downfall. So there was sort of a mix uh, with regard to the arrogant one. And bad, a defense attorney should be able to change his case in the face of opposing evidence. Kyle seems to be too rigid. They only saw one of the descriptions. So it, it was a between subject. Right? Uh, and the prosecutor, nothing. I think he's too compassionate to be a good prosecutor. Nothing stated five times again over and over. I can't think of anything again. He went to law school, was the main <laughs> possible. <laughs> And, and he's too open to see both sides. A good prosecutor needs to be like a bulldog and go straight for the criminal without mercy. Um, it, does not, uh, like, sound, it does not sound like he has a killer instinct. And the arrogant, good, he seems judgmental of people that are different from him and go no end to prove, prove that these people are wrong and he would argue to win every case regardless of the facts. Um, uh, those are the good things and, uh, of the intellectually arrogant prosecutor. None was stated four times for bad stuff. The, so it, in terms of the state, the number of subjects that's, you know, number of times subjects stated that it's, it's better to be intellectually arrogant as a prosecutor and intellectually humble in, in legal domain for a, for a defense attorney is, is pretty clear. Uh, then we move to the last one, and I'll go very quickly through this. We're in the process of collecting data. That is, we're presenting these cases and the types of evidence in a magnet. And Christine can augment what I'm saying here and do what she would like with this, because she's the collector. She sits by the magnet. And mainly, I'll tell you by, by anecdote, one of the main attractions to get in this claustrophobic situation for our law students is that they get a picture of their brain. We do pay them like the going rate, which is about 50 bucks an hour to be in that thing. But mainly, they want to walk home with a picture of their brain. So there's a sort of narcissistic component. <laughs> well, that's my brain. But um, what, what we expect from the self-regulatory argument that somehow or another, these vivid, graphic, perhaps irrelevant things interrupt uh, uh, the, the process by which individuals admit additional evidence and see themselves as potentially not taking account of the full array of evidence. It implicates, uh, you know, sort of, uh, we, we use an uh, orbital front, and this is Lasana's work, and Lasana, we have to see, has to interpret this in, in, in the Netherlands and eventually in England as we collect it. But mostly in the orbital prefrontal, left prefrontal area, you're going to find that, that logic is more likely operative. And when you then demonstrate the case, you can see in what versions of this presentation of evidence you're getting these indications, uh, either in a kind of reward system, which is, is uh, contingent on my experience, or in, in, a, in a different system. And, and, and that's our midbrain structures, which in fact are representing, this, this is a false dichotomy most neuroscientists will tell you, but it is part of the issue. It, you, where you're bypassing some of the more uh, delicate reasoning faculties and sort of relying on more of the affect arousal. And looking at individuals in these different roles, prosecutorial defense roles, as they regard this evidence. Uh, so we're trying to get down to the level of these intrinsic disparities, but again, driven by the evidence. And I think for general researchers in, in, in intellectual humility, it's very important we're prone, like, people out in the world, as social psychologists demonstrated a lot of times, to show the fundamental attribution error. We think if something's important, it varies between people. And if I observe their behavior, it defines something be about them that goes beyond the moment of my observation. So if somebody is aggressive in an observation, we might not know that they were had a gun to their head and were fighting for their life. Um, and, and, but we will attribute, even if we knew that, even if we knew that, the person that's more aggressive in response to this is seen as more dispositionally aggressive.
progressive. <coughs> this was shown in social psychology 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And it still continues to be shown. So, so I think it's important for us who researchers who are interested in this, and Templeton who's trying to get a, a, a fix on what this is, to recognize it might not be that people are good. It might well be that situations evoke the worst from us in terms of this particular attribute. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh, 30 lost, oh, okay, and this is what we're doing. This is what we're predicting, and uh, so this lateral prefrontal cortex activity signifying motion regulation. This is the regulation hypothesis, the evidence, and it, it's true for the jury as well. I mean, showing these dirty pictures uh, really is problematic and is a big part of the case for guilt and penalty. Not to speak of how race contributes to that, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. I, consulted on a legal case. I went to death row in Arkansas to, to consult on it and interview this person. There were 33 people in, uh, on death row in Arkansas awaiting execution for the past 10 years because they, they, don't, they don't know how to kill people. And so they worried about that. And, uh, but 27 of them were, were black men who were put in there when they were young. But about 60% of capital crimes are committed by white Arkansas citizens. So the, the, the this fact is pretty interesting and does indicate the biasing part of it, whether or not it's a direct racial bias or it operates in concert with the kind of evidence presented. Uh, is it personality, who I am? Am I this strong person of great will, like Wonder Woman? Or am I, is it, is it the role of man? Is it who, who, what they want me to be? And, and maybe Superman in the, in, in the Phone booth is an example of that, whether he's Clark Kent, the mild, meek reporter, or the savior, savior of, of, uh, of Gotham, I, I, I'm not really sure which is which. Um, but implications, and then I'm done, and I try to give people some time to do. Uh, we're, we're trying to find a way to educate lawyers differently, given this evidence. How do you educate lawyers? And this is the real world applied part of it. Uh, and we've developed some case studies. We are in the process of developing case studies to use in classrooms and trying to work with law teachers that uh, where law students evaluate approaches to evidence in the light of intellectual humility and cognitive biases and trying to illustrate this operating. And we're working, we, we, part of our collaborators are from Duke Law School and we thought about ways to create uh, intellectual humility workshops for uh, those who are being educated as lawyers. That is, a, to illustrate what the, what the downside of being not humble and what the downside of, of uh, one's outcomes based on one's arrogance, what, uh, based on one's, uh, you know, that you, your arrogance can be good for you in your role. And that's taught a lot in law school. So we, we, we self-present as lawyers, as knowledgeable, of knowing what we believe and of dismissing what anybody else believes. That's what my summation's about, I guess, if I'm a prosecutor. Um, and then uh, prosecutor's office, we have met with, with defense office. We've met with the public defender. We had a conference at Duke where we brought in state prosecutors to talk about this. And uh, one of them really has a system whereby he, he gets uninvolved other prosecutors to come in and evaluate the evidence to see what should be shared, what in fact the, the outcome should be. Very interesting because he's understood the, the, the casualty a uh, false conviction, uh, and we're trying to work with the D the, the person there's a the person who runs the DA's organization in in North Carolina. We've met with him only once. We are really not working with him yet. We'd like to. We've also met with public defenders to talk with them about how to feature evidence differently. And um, uh, future research, I think, should really study the importance of regret. That last big correlation, <coughs> that is the tendency to not regret. Uh, the, the, the fruits of our lack of humility uh, that allows us to not be humble the next time either are, are really, I think, a critical thing to understand, not only for lawyers, but for all of us. Uh, you know, for, for all of us that see ourselves as operating on the basis of systemic rules rather than personal rules, uh, whatever that might be. But in any case, uh, questions are very welcome, and I really appreciate it. Christine, thank you very much. She's responsible for much of this. Okay, now we're in the queue. We only have a few minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. <laughs> that, that's fine. Kate, you want to go ahead, sir? For the bit of 
about the people in the public who said uh, they wanted the prosecutors to be pit bulls. Yeah. Maybe they don't understand that prosecutors actually decide what cases to bring forward. So if that's the case, then once it's, it's there, you want a pit bull. Yes. But you might want somebody more circumspect making the decision. And if, if the standard, I mean, you know, I didn't actually think much about who decides whether the case comes forward. But if I thought that the prosecutor only kicked in after somebody else said, yes. okay, let's accuse um, Jones of killing Smith or whatever, yeah. then I might want a different set of attributes that I would want if it was, you know, from the word go, should we look more carefully before we decide that Jones really on balance ought to be prosecuted? I, so I actually think this is an excellent point because what we don't know is that, I'm talking about educating lawyers, but I'm, the public's understanding of the legal process is not great and they become jurors and they make decisions. <coughs> they also, grand juries do whatever the prosecutor wants most of the time. Yeah. It's very hard for a grand jury not to bring a case forward if the prosecutor brings that case forward. But public education with regard to the legal system would be would be very important and we, we don't have a good good education. We route in our jurors, we, we assign them to a case and they learn as they go along. But I, I don't know how to do that latter thing. But I think it's critically important um, that we understand the conditions under which cases get brought forward by prosecutors that end up committing them to it. So what you have is a confirmation bias. Some of the things that the prosecutors have done that are nasty, withholding evidence, may not be from morally bereft individuals. It may be from individuals who have a confirmation bias, like somebody unfortunately, who makes up their data in their research, okay, who in fact says, well, I made it up, that's true, but I know these things to be true anyway, <laughs> so who needs the data, essentially? I know, I know what the outcome will be. Yeah? So I was curious about uh, the lack of regret over potential uh, wrongful convictions in law students, mm -hmm. and I wonder whether part of this is that they're not actually doing it yet. So my students might ask them ethical questions, they seem very cavalier about the implications, in part because they're not really held responsible for them. So maybe you might get different results if you uh, consulted with actual lawyers? That's a good question. We would love to get, I, I mean, if, if we read out a law, so we had one actual law, law, law professor from who wanting to go to get a picture of a brain, but, but uh, I, uh, I think you're absolutely right. That I, I think if, if there's no consequence for me, if it's not consequential, for me, I can be quite, you know, sort of blasé about the nature of the legal system. And there was no consequence for Scalia either, okay? So nothing was going to happen to him if he made this uh, wrong judgment. But I think you're right. If I'm, I'm the actual guilty party here, I prosecuted the case that sent somebody away for 30 years, 20 years, I have to believe that I would not attribute it. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, I don't know that I could be that conditioned to see the virtue of what I do, to ignore the consequential facts. Time for one more. Thanks. Um, I wonder um, whether you think there's an implication of your results considering what kind of legal system is best for getting the truth. Um, so it seems like a lot of, you, a lot of the, the factors are describing to do with the, the confrontational nature of our legal system. Do you think, um, like a, an inquisitorial kind of system? That's their theory. We, we, one of, I was on a committee in the law school of, of somebody who was getting a Master of Laws from Taiwan, and he was where they have an inquisitorial system. And the, the theory behind the inquisitorial system is that um, uh, is exactly that. That, that, that there isn't an adversary component with a winner and a loser. There's a judger of fact, basically, and that judger. The problem with it, as it exists in Taiwan, and I don't know if it's true in the, in the continental Europe as well, but the problem is that the, the, the inquisitor, the judge, inquisitor, is educated in the same schools as, they still have attorneys, as the prosecutor, okay? That, and, and the defense attorney is out of that fraternity or sorority, mostly a fraternity in China. That, and so it, the, 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 ju the inquisitors have a prosecutorial orientation, at least that's what this Taiwanese student told me, and he did some research to indicate that that was true. Much, much more allowing evidence presented by the prosecutor 
than by the defender of, of, of the allegation. But I think you're right. I think the adversary nature of the legal system is complicated. It's not an athletic event. You know? uh, it's really not an athletic event. And it's not like the strongest person should prevail. Uh, you know, you're trying to operate so that the truth should prevail. And most prosecutors initially are taught that. But you're, they're not winning or losing. They're, they're responsible for the truth becoming evident. That's their role. Um, but nobody rewards them when there's more truthiness. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody awards them when, when there's more truthiness. So I, I, I think that, that, that we have a system that's misaligned. You know, the, the hit rate should be getting it right, not getting a conviction. Uh, and only time tells that. So the next election, I don't, I'm not going to know whether I got it right or wrong most of the time. It's two or three years into the future. Um, so. I, I don't know how to alter that system, but I think you're right. I think the adversary system is a major part of this issue, to have people debating about who, who's guilty and who's not, and the best debater wins, is, is really very problematic. Uh, and, and if these personality factors come in, it's even more problematic, because if intellectual humility means anything, I might self-select as a prosecutor. I might, so I might call myself out, and I'll become a corporate attorney you know, figure out the books, uh, or I, I want to become a criminal defense attorney, the least remunerative of most attorneys' roles, for the most part, unless you're really at the top of it, you get OJ as a client or something, you're, you're, you're going to lose most uh, of what you could benefit from in the way of wealth from being a lawyer uh, by being, a, by being a, a defense attorney, criminal defense attorney. So I thank you all for listening, and any ideas you may have, I'm happy to listen to. Thank you very much.